Well, uh, a returning guest this morning, a uh, long overdue returning guest, who I've got to say is just putting out some of the most fascinating content into the, certainly into the Twitter sphere, if not other social streams. And it's just been really, really interesting to watch this stuff emerge. And I'm like, right, we, we've got to have a chat. What's going on? You're doing some amazing things. Alex Sarama, welcome back. Thank you so much, Stu. It's a pleasure to be on the show um, amongst, obviously, guests who I really look up to and I've really enjoyed learning from over you know, the last three or four years. So thanks so much for having me on. Um, no, I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's a pleasure. And uh, there's so much for us to talk about. I almost don't know where to start. I'm giddy. Um, <laughs> but anyway, let's um, let's start again, because some people might not have gone back through the back catalogue to see you for well, last time you were on you were working for the MBA so let's start there give me a little give us that little bit of backstory and then and then like the journey you've been on all across Europe and probably beyond for all I know so t- <laughs> give fill in the blanks absolutely so last yeah I was working in Madrid for NBA Europe in a basketball operations role so it was mostly kind of doing coaching in terms of camps clinics things like that and it was great, got to travel like everywhere and obviously be exposed to the NBA environment. But that was kind of when I really started learning more about ecological dynamics. And it was actually the conference you did in Stamford when yeah, I was back home. coaching, exactly. hosted, put on by the 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 amazing Juan Gonzalez Mendia. Exactly. And I've, <laughs> I've exchanged some messages with, with Juan just over the years, but that really changed everything for me, Stu, because it was, I was still working for the NBA, but I knew there was a, a a different way of approaching it. And I was kind of starting to experiment and do these things. And I knew I wanted to go in a different direction. And that was really the catalyst for me to completely go all in. And that was actually why I decided to leave and get out of the NBA environment, even though it was, I really enjoyed it. I had an amazing team to work for. I wanted to actually apply this stuff every day and without being constrained and you know i think there are a lot of perceptions especially in the nba as to what coaching is and what it should be mm. and i just it didn't align with the route i was going basically so um it was a tough decision because i was in a really good situation i was very young at the time i think i was 23 so i'd been what well, i started with the nba when i was 21 as soon as i graduated from uni so it was a, a tough decision, a tough call, but I actually, I ended up going to an academy in Belgium just because I had an opportunity to um, try these things and start using an ecological approach every day. Funnily enough, it didn't actually end up working out because I went there and I started doing all these things, Stu, and I thought I would have the freedom and the flexibility to do it. But the other kind of, the other like the technical director, I was the technical director, but like the owner of the club, just didn't uh it didn't align with, with the approach I was doing was completely different to what he was doing. So long story short, um went back home during COVID and then I ended up in Italy after. And this it's been amazing. This is my third season now here. And I've just I basically developed my own academy kind of from scratch for players from all around Europe and further afield. And it's basically I've uh, we're applying a complete ecological approach to everything we do. So not just the basketball, but um like athletic performance and then just kind of how we view our daily interactions with the players and it's been amazing just because I've had the chance every day to research so I typically have like my mornings free so I'm just you know listening to like your podcast reading papers and then every afternoon I get a chance to apply it on court so it's been such a fun mix it's like um it's like you've got like a like a lab where you're conducting these sort of crazy experiments. You know, there's probably explosions going off in my head and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it, it, that's honestly the way I would describe it, like a, a laboratory. And it's um, that's the biggest thing which has allowed me to kind of develop as a coach. And I think it's just a unique kind of atmosphere because I don't have kind of anyone telling me that, you know, this is how it's got to be. I've, I've got complete flexibility and I've got I've developed a staff now of like minded people who really believe in this stuff. And and it's just honestly, it's I feel like very lucky to be because it's such a, an amazing space. And I feel like people who kind of aren't in this ecological world, it's it's very difficult to understand. But it's such a amazing feeling I get just like going to work each day and seeing the things that are happening. 
I, I don't know, like, just going back to what you said earlier on. Firstly, there's a couple of things you said earlier on. Like, you know, you said that you were, you know, you were very young at the time, at the age of 23. It's obviously, it's all, age is obviously all relative, uh, he says, as he faces into his 50th year. Uh, not that that's playing on my mind at all. I think it's probably featuring in every podcast. I probably need to stop. Um, anyway, uh, no, but you said something else as well, which was like, you know, you went to this conference in Stanford which is in a lovely part of uh, Lincolnshire, maybe, I think, uh, in in England, which was uh, very nice and uh, at an excellent time. John, uh, if I remember correctly, um, John O'Sullivan was was there as well as one of the one of the presenters, Mark Bennett. Um, uh, so, yeah, and you're working for the MBA, right? <laughs> you went to this conference and then you decided to leave the MBA. So I feel like there's a sense of responsibility. Like, should I apologize? But then it sounds like it all worked out. So <laughs> no, I, honestly, it's like I remember it was such a like gut wrenching decision, and it was mm. so difficult to make. Yeah. But I I was trying to really go like fully like ecological in in the on court stuff I was doing, mm. uh, and it just for various reasons I just I wasn't kind of able to do it just because of the constraints I had in terms of yeah. um what kind of was wanted so I I start that was actually when I first started putting like some of my ideas on Twitter just oh. like experimenting from like the different settings and I think it really helped my coaching because I was going to like different countries every week uh, a lot of the times working with players who and kids who didn't speak English mm. and I was just always doing new things i think like something which was interesting with the nba was it was like the clinics like obviously great people i was working with but the, the clinics were typically always the same you know so it was like a practice plan and it would you know be the same drills done over and over again and i just for me it was like i wanted to do something a little bit more simulated not just for the kids but also for me and the people seeing our stuff and always do different activities and you know really push the boundaries and I just felt like the best way, if I wanted to come back to the NBA world and maybe work for an NBA team, I thought the best thing to do would actually be to leave the NBA, experiment and learn these things. And and I remember, you know, at the time, a lot of jobs in the NBA were kind of through networking and really getting to know people. And of course, that's important and that's a big part of it. But I remember feeling like I didn't want to get a job just for that reason. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get a job because the quality of work was doing something that no one else in the basketball space is doing at that moment in time. Um, and yeah, I think now it's great because NBA teams, um, you know, talking to teams about the things I'm doing here with the Academy in Italy. And I think, you know, there will be a shift in the next few years to a more ecological approach. I really believe that. You know what? I was just thinking that as you were talking, um, I, 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 I do agree. I can, I can see, it's almost if I'm hesitant to say this, and I'm now thinking whether I should. Oh, well, I will. I will. I thought it, so I will. Um, it's a little bit like the a lot of professional sport is now looking to, at the very least, some of the ideas and principles of ecological dyna dynamics, uh, or at least the certainly the kind of approach, let's say, as a means by which to develop athletes professional athletes whether it's developing ones or or existing ones but particularly developing ones they are looking at that and it's almost become like the new money ball the new saber metrics uh you know rob gray you know he's public now he's got going to the red Sox. um i was approached by another major league baseball franchise about potentially going there which you know i i couldn't make work from a personal perspective there's others I know out there who are already embedded in certain pro sport teams. And I think they're quite secretive about it because they don't want to lose their, um, their kind of edge, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I think there's definitely a real interest in, I mean, certainly in the world of baseball, I know in the world of football, soccer as well, there's a lot of, you know, clubs who are starting to get embedded practitioners in there in technical roles, mm -hmm. guiding, you know, if you look at, for example, at Barcelona, you know, uh, Paco Sorelio, I probably butchered his name there, but he's been there for years as a sort of director of methodology. And I don't know if he necessarily would say that his kind of thinking is ecological dynamics per se. Yeah. However, uh, it, a lot of his writing and a lot of what he talks about, you know, using ideas around complex adaptive systems and things like that are obviously rooted in many of the theoretical principles. And he's been there for years. So, 
you know, like you, you can probably now, be, I think you've got the guys at AIK, obviously with Marco Sullivan or, and James Vaughan, very rooted in the ecological dynamics concept constructs. All of these people are obviously now working in these different spaces. And it's it's a bit like there's a growing momentum and it's starting to gain some a little bit more traction. Now, it worries me. And the reason I was hesitant to say it, because, if, you know, if there's sort of technical directors out there or owners of these sports franchises who are thinking, oh, I'm going to parachute pe ecological dynamics people in and it's all going to magically transform my team and we're going to win, the, you know, we're going to win the uh the world series next year or whatever it might be it's not going to work like that it's going to be a longer term project so i don't want to create any and i don't necessarily want to see this gold rush of ecological dynamics practitioners and you know well having said that it wouldn't be a bad thing but i kind of you know there's a part of me that is nervous about mainstreaming it in that way because obviously it's an emerging field we're all still experimenting as you are we're all still uh, i guess pushing at the boundaries of the capability not the capabilities yeah the capabilities but also the what are the limits you know what are the what what, what are the you know where does uh the ecological approach you know kind of fit where does it best work where are the things you know what are the challenges where are the areas that we still need to explore there's lots of questions that still need to be answered and the research is being done practically on the ground in in places like southampton and others yeah. but it's it's still a space that needs a lot more exploration so there's a, there's a nervousness but it's also very exciting it's so interesting. I like just unpacking so many of those the things you just said, Stu. I, I actually was fortunate enough. I did a presentation last week for an NBA franchise, and I actually finished just with a photo from the Moneyball movie. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to be too like corny, but I was like, I honestly feel like if you adopt those ideas, not just to how you approach kind of the, the work you're doing with the players, whether that's the team practices or the player development, but like the whole incorporate like an ecological approach to the whole franchise. So I honestly think if you incorporate an ecological framework, it avoids all the siloed thinking that I think we see a lot of right now, um, especially in, you know, in, in the highest level of basketball, where you have the athletic trainer, like working independently, like the player development staff and analytics staff front office. But imagine if you can apply this stuff to everything like front office scouting analytics, yeah. I, I think it would be amazing just to use the ecological approach as like a unified framework. And then, what was really interesting too was you, you were talking about just you know we're still learning and figuring this out i've actually been really enjoying this year working with uh paris basketball which is a pro team in the euro cup so second highest level of basketball in europe and an amazing head coach will weaver who's fully progressive and i think he's he's probably one of the leading figure head coaches in bar in the basketball space who understands like ecological dynamics and, and is we're actually, so I'm working with Will and we're actually been doing this the whole season. And it's been fascinating because it's, I'd say how we do it. It's obviously not the same as what I'm doing in my Academy because we have like two games a week. There's a lot of travel with our schedule and it's like some of the biggest challenges have been how can we do like worthwhile activities on like a low stress practice day, like, you know, after we've been having a lot of travel in one week, but that's been really interesting because I've been able to work on some unique ideas there and then take some things from what I'm doing here at the Academy and just adapt it. I'm going to put a flag in that because I want to come back to that because that's yeah. really interesting. I'd like to drill into that and find out a bit more about the sort of things that you're doing practically. Just before we get into that though, um, the Academy itself. So firstly, um, uh how, how did you arrive there you know you're in a relatively small part of northern italy how did you arrive there particularly how did it get set up and then you know you're bringing in people from all over europe and i i'm assuming it's partly because they're coming as a means by which to develop themselves because they're looking for some kind of professional outlet somewhere in either in europe or potentially even the states so just give me exactly. the genesis of what it what it is and what it's called yeah. and all that Absolutely true. So the name is very simple. It's just college prep because in, in <laughs> Italy, college means school of basketball. Right. So the, the club itself is just called college. But I mean, what happened was during as COVID happened, I left my role in Belgium and I I actually joined Basketball Immersion, which is like a basketball specific coach education company. Yeah, we have known and them I, for a long time. Yeah, exactly. So really enjoy working with Chris Oliver there. And I basically needed somewhere where I could a, a club where I could film and where a, cl a club would be open-minded to allow me to film content and use that for immersion and, and you know, all of that. So the actual, the only place in Europe where I could get 
uh, a job where they'd be flexible enough for me to do this. And coach was here in this town. And the first year I didn't have, uh, I, wa I was a player development coach working they, with some of the better Italian kids they have. So they bring kids in from all over Italy. But then I, I was applying an ecological approach to the player development. But then obviously um, I wanted to take it one step further and also impact what was going on in like the team practices and all of that. And I figured I couldn't do it with the Italian players because I wouldn't, I wasn't allowed to coach because of the licensing system here. Okay. So I said to the club, you know, if I can create my own team here just for players outside of Italy who want to go on to like play NCA basketball or something else, can we do that? And they're like, yes. So that was basically the green light I needed to basically start my own section of the club, if that makes sense. And college prep was born. And then kind of what, what I wanted to do was just uh, completely go all in ecological approach and show, show the results to the world basically. And it's been amazing because what we do, we're in our second year now of the prep and the, the first year was obviously last year, but like the steps we've taken in a year, it's been so fun. Like I'd say like how we approach things now, it's, just I look back to the things we did in our first year and I can't believe we did some of those things. Uh like what? He says, so, begging the question. <laughs> absolutely. So I would say, um, like it's amazing. The more you learn just about, and this is why the research to me is so useful, because the more I read stuff, the more it makes me question kind of what I've been doing, which mm -hmm. I don't think would ever happen if I wasn't like reading papers. So I'll give you an example just on like shooting. Like we would be fully ecological. But then in our approach, but then we would waste a lot of time where players were doing just unopposed because players always want to shoot in basketball. Right. And the, the challenge I had was a lot of our shooting. Yes, we were doing like different forms of one on one on two on one. But then the guys still wanted to get their shots up and just shoot. Right. So um, we now this is actually where we've. I learned more about differential learning and I like we see a good value to using like DL ideas just for shooting. We wouldn't use it for anything else, but especially players like when they come into a gym, they've got like 15 minutes where instead of just doing like spot shooting, which is very common in basketball, where they shoot from the same spot every time over and over again, just like very small things like educating the players and we get them to uh, constantly be changing range, changing the type of shot. And instead of just having their partner rebounding for them, they're becoming and contesting sometimes. So it's, we get great, you know, rep without rep. It's, and it's just for our shooting, it's been amazing. So we have loads of small things like that. And then I think the biggest thing, Stu, has kind of been the style of play, like principles of play. And it's not a game model because I think a game model is too rigid. But as I was learning more about ecological dynamics, I was like, well, how we actually approach how we play offense and defense needs to align with ecological ideas. And the problem in basketball is all the offenses and defenses we see up to that point, like did not align because it was very patterned, mm. very rigid, like a set play or a motion mm. offense. Mm. And mm. basically players are just meant to be very robotic, repeating this over and over again. And what I kind of say is that players are basically being attuned from not acting on appropriate affordances because they're running the pattern. So they could have like a wide open space to exploit after like five seconds in the offense, but they don't act on that opportunity because they have this model, this mental model of a play that the coach wants them to run. So we, we, we've kind of taken conceptual offense and really embraced it. And it's basically, instead of me calling stuff from the sidelines, the players just flow into offense. So we have some very basic principles like spacing, how we space the floor and we call them triggers. So they're just actions and the guys just get into triggers and they just create an advantage and that's it. Um, and it's been, I post quite a bit, obviously on Twitter, just with how the guys are adapting. And it's just amazing to watch what they're doing within the offense, because I never know what's going to happen next. It's, and that for me is like the best form of basketball. Uh, I mean, so fascinating. There's so many things I want to, I want to explore. A question comes into my head, though, which is a difficult question. Um, so forgive me, which is you're called college prep. Yes. So how do you um, I imagine you've thought this through. How do you square the kind of thing that, you know, you know, full well that the likelihood is they're going to go to another environment that's going to be nothing like yours? Exactly. So kind of what what's your thought process on that? Great question. So we. We've actually we actually had a meeting with our coaches specifically about this a month ago, 
um, because I was getting concerned that, and it's, I don't want to talk down on other coaches and they're mm -hmm. awesome coaches doing great things, even if they're not fully ecological yet, you mm -hmm. know, but the problem is like, we see a lot of things in our sport where it's like yelling and screaming a lot at the guys, especially in college, there's a lot of like abusive practice, mm -hmm. not just at college, but in other academies in Europe. And, you know, it's like, we, we were actually saying that our guys are in a bit of a bubble. And it's like some some of them realize that, but some of them have no idea because this is kind of like all they've known for two years. And they've they really like don't know what it's like on the outside. So actually, we did a few things. One, we actually watched um on Netflix, we have a weekly life skills session, which could be anything. And we actually spent one of them watching uh Last Chance You basketball. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a good example <laughs> talk about uh, differential learning <laughs> and it was some of the, it was amazing though because some of the guys were just like it was eye-opening for them and they had no idea um but then we we do a, like more practical examples we do a lot of we call it uh like player-led practice where we all say stuff to them like we did it we do it like three times a week where we'd give them like 15 and it's great for co-design and everything we we'll give them 15 or 20 minutes of a practice and we'll say something like okay imagine you're at college and the only shooting you do is with like the shooting machine that the college makes you do mm -hmm. so you've got student managers because you have that at college in the ncaa and you can use them for however you like so you've got to design an activity which is representative and they know what that means because we we kind of give them the language um, and you, you know, incorporating the ideas that we would normally do in our team practices, design your own activity. So it's really cool just seeing some of the best activities actually are the ones they design. And then we just put it in our, you know, player development or team practices. So we do a lot of things like that where they are responsible kind of for their own development and actually understanding how they can kind of create activities, which are beneficial. That's that's really interesting. I mean, it's something I've been thinking about more and more. In you know this notion of sort of co-design, co-creation, um, where the the act of the athletes or the players almost becoming ecological practitioners themselves, whether you use the language or not. I mean, yeah. and, and I think using the language is probably a good idea. Um, uh, but actually, them you know almost like thinking like game designers in many ways which you know they yeah. would do anyway wouldn't they if they were if they were probably just like playing pickup games they might add in extra dimensions and rules and stuff to make the game fairer for example in order to alleviate you know kind of size differentials or whatever it might be they would sort of do that so actually encouraging that more we, and again that's been taken away from a lot of activities because what we often do is like you say you know we're working ecologically but we're not necessarily involving them as much ecologically in the process so actually them being game designers really enriches the activity doesn't it oh massively so and and like they feel like responsible like responsible for more responsible for their own learning but just having it all coach led um and i think too just in the prac in the team practice like you know the practice plan is not there to be followed um so we will often do things like yesterday where i actually get the guys designing their own like activities and constraints so we had a they we came up with a really cool one so we were playing 4 on 4 and they we had two players were only allowed to score inside the smile and two players from outside the three, but they couldn't score anywhere else. And the other team didn't know until the game started. Just a second. It, for the, for yeah. those who aren't basketball aficionados, and actually you've used a term that I'm not aware of anymore, the smile. Sorry, I should have said that is the <laughs> area right. right underneath the basket. Oh, that the, the like sort that. of semicircle. Exactly. Ah, I right. call it the smile. That's okay. exactly it. Oh, cool. No, I like that. <laughs> I'll remember yeah. that. So, um, and it, so that was the activity and it was four on four and it was amazing just seeing like what they started doing and some of the offensive sequences and defensive sequences, like how they were adapting. And then what we did is we did a timeout and they said, okay, you have an option to, uh, to change the players or keep it the same, but just small things like that, like giving them a chance to involve them in the process. I think it's really fun. Mm, yeah. I love it. Um, just going back to, um, some other stuff that you were talking about earlier on. I'm really interested in this notion of triggers. So um, I'd love to know how how you developed that, firstly developed that concept. It's really interesting. And also how it, how it applies and how you go about even like developing that within a group. Because in, yeah. in my, it's something that I've been struggling with a little or 
I say struggling, exploring. <laughs> I'm not struggling. I'm just exploring. Um, yes. But it's not something I'm necessarily think I've cracked as well, which is this idea of sort of shared. I think what you're talking about, when you talk about triggers is shared affordances. Exactly what it is. Okay. That's so true. yeah, please expand because that's really exactly. fascinating. So I think like the origins and, you know, it's looking more like forms of life, but in the U S like conceptual offense has been more kind of popular in the NBA, but it's very different to how we would do it mm. just in terms of, I'd say how the players kind of, I, I feel like I'm it's unique and I'm lucky because we have so many practices, like, especially compared to an NBA team, the guys are just able to adapt more. And like, I think do, you know, like, run triggers very skillfully in terms of coming up with loads of different solutions, combining the triggers in different ways. But I mean, essentially this is all, all it is, is we, we call them names, right? So they do have a name. So a pick and roll, like on the side could just be called side, right? A pick and roll in the middle could just be called like middle or rub. And then they're all one, typically one syllable. And then we might have something else like a flare a wide, which would be an off ball screen. And then, so we, we have these triggers and it literally just be a case of early season. I, I let them play like how I'd start is we'd just play like a full three on three, five on five. And I'll just constrain them with the shot selection. So for instance, there's a lot in basketball talking about the inefficiency of shooting mid range jump shots. Right. So I would just constrain them where I'd give them more points to getting rim finishes and threes as opposed to the mid range. So that would kind of be the first thing I did. And then naturally what started to happen was they would do some of these triggers just naturally so then what we did is we looked at the video pulled it and then we just started giving those things names right so it wasn't a case of me going in teaching and saying you must do this and this and then so we pulled from the video what some of these triggers were that they were doing and they were like you know this is the offense that we want to play now of course they're not they weren't going to self-discover everything right in terms of the trigger combinations but so I, I sometimes what I do is I'd be like, okay, this is, and I was very intentional in my language. I'm saying this is one possible trigger or something like a pistol, which would be like a, a handoff followed by a flare screen. This is what pistol is. But the key thing is here, guys, I want you to explore and go off script as much as you can. So for instance, it's two triggers put together, but if you have an opportunity to exploit space off the first one, or, or we don't even need to get because you can drive by your defender, then do that. So it's like the whole kind of foundational piece of the offense is what we call dominoes. Again, that's an analogy for creating an advantage. So it's like, as soon as we have an advantage, like the defense out of position or like driving downhill, and it's like a four on three or something like that. It's basically dominoes. And we want to keep the dominoes falling until we get a great shot. So it, the whole idea is we run the triggers to get to dominoes. We don't run the triggers to run the triggers and just have these meaningless patterns. So they're basically becoming expert hunt, hunters of dominoes. And, you know, we're relentless doing it. And it's the whole kind of style of play is built into that. So we play incredibly fast. So most teams in basketball street will play very slowly. And again, it's just like there are way the affordances to create dominoes are just easier in transition because it's just the way it is because there's more space, more gaps to exploit, less defenders back. So you, we call it fast and furious. So, you know, that's basically how we play. And we, we'd have a lot of constraints. Like if you score within six seconds of being scored on, it's worth double. If you, if you drive the ball and you enter the paint, which is, you know, like the lane, the restricted area, and you get a paint touch within five seconds of getting possession, it's worth double. So, and then obviously the idea is, is so we're trying to play with extreme pace, extreme pace. If they cannot be in dominoes, then the players just get straight into a, a trigger and it's lag. We call it lag free, like avoid the spinning wheel of death on the Mac. We have a lot of these like analogies and it's like the players call it, they have to decide what trigger they think is best based on, the opposition, like who are their poor defenders, the space that they're in, the like our strengths in terms of what players we have that are, you know, really, really effective out of particular actions. And that's all on them. I'm saying nothing. And the only thing I will do, Stu, is when the it, it's dead ball offense. So that when the ball goes out of play and like there's a foul or a violation, that's when I will call a set play, which is what most teams will do 99% of the time regardless. But the key difference is, because the players are attuned to all the affordances out of these actions, when we run a set play, it can be devastating because every single part of the set, they're looking for dominoes. 
Whereas the other team, you know, most of the other teams would play, they're running the set to get to the end of the set. And then they don't create an advantage. They have to take a bad shot. So when we do run a set, it, it's even more effective. So that's a lot I've just uh, spooled out. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, it is, but it's brilliant. I mean, let me just... um. Let me just wheel through some of the terminology for anybody who isn't necessarily au fait with. So, you know, when you talk about, for example, the paint, the paint is the area d- directly under the basket, right? That's what exactly. they, you know, the, I used to call it the key. You call it the paint exactly. now, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's um, it. And also when you were, you are just going to think what we're talking about. Yeah, you were talking about, for example, when you talked about the mid-range stuff. So I've noticed this in pro basketball as well. Basically, you don't see many, because obviously you've got the three-point line. You either see shots from outside a three-point line because obviously you get three points, which is an advantageous thing, exactly. but it also has a lower percentage of going in, albeit you right. wouldn't necessarily know that with how accurate some of the guys are from really quite long range when you particularly watch sort of something like Steph Curry shoot, you know. Yeah. However, so I basically the the you go you go from really long you go from long range outside a three point area why because you, it's worth it because you get the extra point or you get in close and get get close to the rim as as you can because obviously the percentage of scoring in that area is is higher because you're closer to the basket taking really? shots from outside of that range inside a three point area but not that close to the basket actually has a a lower outcome because of the exactly. fact you don't get a point so you, you exactly. you're generally speaking not seeing as many of those now is that right and, well this is the interesting thing so many teams are still taking those shots. Mm. Like it's insane. And it just, from a basic maths perspective, it makes zero sense, but for some reason it's not being emphasized. And for me, I view shot selection as like one of the key, like task constraints in the offense, but what it's done Stuart is it's been amazing because it's, it's given the guys more, it's made them way more skilled at finishing and Mm. shooting threes. Mm. And those are things they need to be more effective players at the next level. So it's like by taking something away, it's like amplified the affordances to actually get downhill and finish in traffic against bigger bodies, find spaces under the rim. And that's really important. And then too, because they know that, you know, there's such an emphasis we place on the offense and shooting threes, they like, they're so much more motivated to go to a gym and just like shoot and, and it's forced them to do those things, which they will need for the next level. But a lot of teams still aren't doing the incorporating the mid range. It's been spoken a lot in the NBA, but starting with the Houston Rockets, they kind of went very analytical. But then it's like that's where I think how the next step is okay, take the analytics, but then use an ecological framework as opposed to just taking the analytics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, and again, I, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff being done in the analytics space, like you say, putting an ecological lens on the use of analytics. So instead of, for example, like one one really interesting example I know that colleague colleague of mine's experimenting on is there's a lot of analytics put on now like for example gaze behavior so for example how many how many times does an individual's head turn in order to scan and that's like the analytic that's used right but it's pretty meaningless because what are they looking at so if yeah. they turn their and I do know that there are children now have twigged onto this. So what they now do, they're sort of training themselves to continuously turn their head because that's a behavior that's that's deemed to be a good behavior, particularly for a midfield player. But it's what they're looking at that matters. So so turning your head is one thing, but actually if you turn your head just blindly and then you're not really looking at like in order you're not trying to create, you know, if you're not using that to create a picture of like what's around you to then to then utilize, then it's so it's a good example of how analytics is starting to shift now towards more um, uh, in-depth. Well, e- eco- sorry, analytics, which is ecologically informed, means that you're going to collect data on different things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and also, Stuart, it's like it's not a case of saying we're never going to take those shots because if yeah. it's six seconds or less than the clock, the guys know we will happily take a mid range. Mm-hmm. It's just it's we're kind of like forcing them to put attention on other things which are more efficient and like the knock-on effect of that like i obviously i spoke about the finishing the three-point shooting but it's amazing too how you see the players interact with space in terms of actually finding spaces more to get open so if a player is like driving and they're getting in the paint because they know we're gonna, not going to look for that mid-range more the other teammates are kind of putting themselves in positions where the player with the ball can see them 
And I think, you know, all these things would not be happening if I just allowed them to come down and take like a pretty low value shot early in the offense. Mm. So just circling back to this notion of the of the triggers and the dominoes, I absolutely love that notion, by the way. I think it's an absolutely brilliant construct. The domino idea is really, really clever. I really like the metaphor. I think it would really resonate, particularly with young people. Yeah. So we're looking for dominoes, which are basically is we're looking from we're looking for opportunities for it to gain advantage, sort exactly. of thing. Yeah, that's exactly it. Mm. Yep. Now you mentioned some of the triggers because what you're saying is some of the triggers, the the, the descriptions of the triggers that you gave me, it, like a pick and roll, for example. So for those who are uninitiated, the pick and roll in in basketball, you're allowed to sort of deliberate. With with some limitations, you're allowed to deliberately obstruct, like block, exactly. aren't exactly. you? As long as exactly. you stood, as long as you stood still, you can block. If you move to obstruct somebody, then that is considered an obstruction. But if you stand still, so you can cleverly, if you if you coordinate between two players, one in possession of the ball and one out of possession of the ball with a defender, if you if you can coordinate your activity well enough, then the person with the ball can go can use the other person on their team as a blocker to stop their um opponent from being able to follow them essentially or at the very least they've got to go a long way round, and therefore it's harder for them to be able to do the defense which creates momentary advantage often you know like it's not often nowadays i think because of the way players switch and stuff that you see i mean i used to love when i played two on two back in the day in um on the uh, on the playground at at school, I used to love picking and rolling. I, I used to love setting picks. It was my absolute favorite thing. <laughs> like I'd love it. I like love it when you get a really good pick and roll. You know, so I go up. I, I, I we get a visual contact. They see what I'm going to do. I pitch myself. They go round, and like e- either they go round and shoot, or they go round and I roll off and I get the ball and I'm get scored. It's the best thing in the world, right? When I, when you can make one of those happen. Yeah. So you're, you know, kind of using say something like a pick and roll in a particular area as a means by which, but you're not basically, so the big difference is what you're not doing. And it sounds to me as well that you've on occasion, well, no, in fact, you've, you have, you, you've sort of explicitly explored these movements, these kind of coordinative movements, interact, let's call them interactions to use some Marco Sullivan language. You've explored yeah. these moments of interaction, exactly, not, not just to, and probably explicitly kind of talked through their utility in certain dimensions, yeah. which you have to do, because like you said, you use exactly. a really good phrase, which is you couldn't expect them to self-organize to this yes. all the way exactly. through. So at points yeah. you've had to use either instruction or descriptive language to talk through these moments. And in order to though, not to just do them on their own, like we're going to learn to do a pick and roll, you'll use it. You're saying this is something that y- you we've now found that leads to a moment of advantage i.e a domino exactly. yeah from which we could then potentially put in another trigger connect the trigger together to lead to a greater domino and then exactly. you're beginning to sort of create those and then what you're then doing is you're combining these moments of interaction as a mechanism through which players are developing a shared understanding of how they coordinate their movement, which then leads to advantage opportunities momentary. And then and, they, and it's then it's then how they exploit those that you're really interested in. Is that right? Now, how they exploit is the biggest part, because I'm not telling them what to do as the pick happens. And because, yeah. you know, look at the affordances out of a pick and roll. It's just it's plentiful like you could reject the pick and drive downhill and not use it you might like you said shoot pass into the picker who's rolling to the rim um you might dribble around you might pass back you might pass ahead you might pick again like there are probably like 30 different things you could do yeah Yeah. and again it's like we are then just you know that's where you know effective and purposeful manipulation of constraints come in because that is how we're getting them attuned to these different solutions. So for instance, one of the key task constraints in a pick and roll would be how the defense defends the pick, right? And in basketball, maybe we have seven different ways that the defense could defend it, right? So they could switch, they could double team it, they might be in a drop. So there are loads of different things. So, you know, what we would do is typically we'd constrain the defense. So I have one, one of our favorite games here is called Hitman, right? So the offense has to run pick and roll and the defense gets a point each time they get a stop, which means they don't allow the offense to get to dominoes by using different defensive strategies to defend the pick and roll. Right. So naturally we get repetition without repetition and the defense will 
it's great for self-discovery because they're switch it, they're blitz it, they might ice, drop, next, all show, all these different things. And then naturally, what does it lead to the offense doing? Well, they have to adapt and they have to now find out. We call it like a coverage solution. So they have to find and explore a coverage solution for that coverage to start dominoes. And this is the key thing. So the triggers help, you know, put the players in these situations where they can exploit these advantages. And, you know, they're calling the triggers and then they're just finding their own coverage solutions. And obviously, you know, some players will be like, our point guard is really like, he's small, he's six or three, but really lightning quick. So, you know, something he might have the action capabilities to like split through a tight space if the defense show. Whereas maybe we have our six foot nine player handling the ball in the pick and roll. And again, like we're getting on so much, but it's this subverts the traditional thing way of thinking because with this way, we can have things like our big players actual handle the ball in pick and roll, whereas most coaches will have them set picks. So, you know, we can do completely wild things. So he might be handling, he can't split through a gap, but he might be able to dribble off and shoot easily because he's got such a height difference to his defender, right? So this is like where it gets fascinating. And this is what I've just loved about the experimentation over two years. Cause I think we've really embedded an ecological dynamics rationale into how we actually play basketball, not just how we approach practice. And so that, that just to touch on that then, um, God, we're shooting off in so many different directions. It's amazing. Oh. <laughs> um, just to touch on that then. So, I mean, I smiled uh, as you uh, mentioned the idea of, you know, the, the big player, doing something different than the traditional role of the big player, which is basically stand pretty close to the basket and get rebounds more or less. Right. Yep. <laughs> um, yeah. Or set picks and stuff. Yeah. And, and so this notion of the freedom, so like you say, so an opportunity for an opportunity, uh, a domino potentially is when you have a mismatch. So, for example, a big player guarded by a smaller player means that smaller player isn't really going to be able to guard the shot effectively. Exactly. So, actually, let's utilize exactly. that. We call it turtle or mouse. So, that's actually one of our <laughs> triggers. So, if the, and this is again, is all based on the players. So, what we do to develop that, Stu, is because we don't have a turtle is basically a traditional big man who can't move. You see them <laughs> everywhere. We don't actually have any turtles on our team because our big guys are really fast. Yeah. But so what I had to do in practice was create a way to constrain that. So one solution was me playing, right? Just, I hate doing players versus coaches, but if I pick a player and say, you're the turtle, it's not that representative because they can move and they're not going to create advantages. So we play like a five on five, but with me as one of the players. So then they can use me to attack me and I'm not going to get my feelings offended. You know, if they're finding ways to attack me as the turtle. You and don't mind the, being the turtle. Yeah, no, exactly. And then the mouse <laughs> would be a small player guarding one of our bigs. And that's when they'd find the spacing solution to have that player go close to the rim and get him the ball. And what we did was we had the constraint was one player has to play with their hands behind their back on defense. So then naturally, obviously, they're going to find ways to attack. And then what you see was amazing was the defense was adapting to that stew and finding ways to help and protect the mouse. So obviously, they're not going to want the mouse just to be posted up right on the rim. So then they started these amazing rotations, double teams. It was great. So that's that's another example, exactly like you said, of how just recognizing the players and understanding like, discrepancies and in individual constraints is a huge part of creating dominoes there's an advance it's yeah. really interesting and so it's about the recognition of yeah. so it's about recognizing the the moments of opportunity or where there's the disadvantage exactly. so interestingly i mean it's obviously quite obvious when you're there as the turtle you know they're obviously just going to basically i imagine they have great fun picking on you don't they exactly <laughs> and i do it in short like we are we only did it twice this season because it was enough and it was like five minutes and they got it and then the thing is like when we play teams then it's on them like obviously i might help guide their like attention in a timeout but they're so my guys credit to them they've become so attuned to these things i really need to they're just literally a turtle would come on the bench would start yelling turtle and then they just do it so it you know and, and, and we're off it's, it's done and then they have to sub the turtle off and you know you've made me la you've made me laugh because i'm thinking to myself right well if i do that if i do that for you like what what's what's my so i'm going to be i've got to be the hippo <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm not going to ask them to, to name it because <laughs> I'm, I'm worried what they'll come up with. <laughs> the dump truck. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, no, I mean, that, again, fascinating. I, what I love, did they come up with that, by the way, turtle on mouse, or is that just a sort of okay. convention? I introduced that terminology to them. Right, so I right. said, like, um, so it's like, we, we do have a very specific language, but again, oh. it's not like soup. It's not very prescriptive. It's just, uh, and I, I find it really helps because it just, they can talk. It's like knowledge of us is knowledge about, right? It's, yeah. it gets into the list, but like, you know, understanding just, it's not like a knowledge of very specific like patterns and things. It's just one thing to get their attention to something. And they could be like, in a game, it's really advantageous because they could just be like, uh, Mike's got the turtle and then we're off done. Yeah, it and it it's in the in the dynamics and the chaos of the game having these keywords, let's call them, that uh, essentially um, enable everyone to to like you say dr it draws attention to a That's place. Exactly what it does. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't say do this. It says exactly. this is where we need to place. So, and it's so it's basically a a, a, sh a shorthand way. You know, in the same way that like in the game you can't say. You know, you, you don't want somebody to have to use multiple words, you know. So I, I very often, for example, like use language like we, we have similar things but where I talk about tucking in. Sure. Right. So that what that means is like, you know, we want to we want to take defensively. We want to take the space in the middle of the field away. Sure. So the idea of, you know, sort of tucking in that these kind of language. But like likewise, I've used interestingly some similar sort of animal based analogies like um when we've lost possession particularly in the center of the field when we're probably then at our most of uh, particularly like in the the center of the field and and right in the center of the field i.e um you know the, the middle of the field going up and down and the middle of the field going sideways right that's when you're at your most vulnerable because they have the most options to be able to go and you are you're compromised as well because you were in possession you've probably got players who've been working hard to get ahead of the play because we exactly. don't, a bit like in basketball, we don't have offsides. So you want ones. you want people yeah. to create stretch, yeah. So you've had people doing that, and we, but that's when we're at, we've lost possession for whatever reason, and we're now vulnerable. So, for example, that's armadillo moment, right? We've got to curl up in a ball and protect ourselves. So the idea is is that we shrink into the middle to just create in, to put to put numerical superiority into that space to force the ball somewhere else to create exactly. a, at least a momentary delay, which gives us an opportunity to then reorganize, not reorganize exactly, but you know what I mean? Like exactly. yeah. create mass, yeah. you know, that, so that's a, an, an idea that, you know, I often put into this armadillo moment. You sometimes hear them talking about it, armadillo, armadillo, you know, that kind of thing. Absolutely. It's, it's like principles of play versus rigid game models where, you know, you're saying exactly how to do it and what to do when they get to, and that just, doesn't make sense with the complex nature of a team sport. It's like, and what I say to coaches is they're trying to control the uncontrollable. Like if, if you're heading into basketball and trying to run these very patterned things, at the end of the day, the players just aren't going to do that anyway because the the action, the, the movement's going to break down and they're going to have to create an advantage and they're probably just going to go one-on-one -on -one or get to some type of trigger anyway. And if they're not exposed to doing that in practice and they haven't got used to developing solutions out of it it's probably not going to be successful i heard a phrase yesterday from a from a colleague who's in our innovation team that i really like that i think resonates with what you're talking about here which is so the concept of dominoes the concept of triggers um the language the language framework that you're using around those things to be able to sort of create uh, a shared notion of where moments of advantage might be. So it's basically like, you know, what I love about it is it's you're using language. Well, uh, it's, it's, I call, it's almost linguistic affordances because you're using mm -hmm. language as a means by which to direct attention. Now, you can obviously do that in the environment by the, the rule The rule architecture that you create means that, you know, we've got to play, like you did, like you said at the start, you know, we give a priority to um, scoring close to the rim or by the way, let's just say we take all the other options. We're going to have a priority, right, to scoring close to the rim. So, okay, that focuses that focuses attention there, right? And it's about how we can exploit opportunities to get into that space. You can do that with a rule architecture, or you can do that with a linguistic, um, you know, kind of uh, 
I guess, you know, piece of... So, for example, if in the game, if they, for example, said something along the lines of... And I hasn't. I has, what, what do you what do you call it when you when there are there's a an opportunity to exploit under the rim? Have you got some language you use? Oh, to be honest, not really. Like, if if it's like a small player guarding a big, that's when we would call mouse. But otherwise, it's like things like just cuts that happen in the moment. Like we just kind of would, you know. I think the fact that we're doing all these things in practice, players will just see it, and they're just you know, if they see an open teammate, we trust their ability to just act on that affordance and pass. Yeah. So even though you're drawing attention to certain opportunities or moments of moments that you can exploit, it may not be that that actually still stays there at that moment. You have to find something else beyond that. So I get that. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean. What it is, is uh, it's a, it's a scaffold, not a cage. And and you can take that scaffold away because now, Stuart, honestly, like we did, so we do music during a lot of practices. We did a section yesterday where the constraint was they weren't allowed to call triggers. Now, obviously, I wouldn't have been able to do that at the beginning because they didn't understand the different kind of opportunities for how they could interact with each other. They didn't know what like triggers were. But now because they've spent six months exploring, so I played loud music so they and I, so they couldn't, it was like arena music. So they couldn't communicate and run tr- and say pistol, pick, whatever. And it was amazing just seeing the flow. So it's like my my goal towards the end of the season would be, can we get into the offense? And sometimes we might call the first trigger and sometimes we might just flow into it. And that would be really cool, I think. Yeah, I love that. I mean, like you say, I, I've experimented with that as well, playing in silence. It's really fascinating, actually, how how it improves things because – Sometimes when they can call for the ball, for example, the players use the auditory information as a means by which to sort of uh, orientate. So they'll often like, for example, pass, but not with a great deal of care and not always knowing where the other individual would like the pass in order to exploit. So when you take away the auditory, they have to get visual connection, which if the other player is signaling appropriately, means that they'll actually then tune into the fact that that that's where the, that individual wants wants the would like the ball because they've got an idea about what their next opportunity for action might be but when you sometimes have the auditory you know and people have got their head down because they're under pressure they just fling at that space they fling at the call which you you don't always want sometimes you have to but you don't necessarily so true so true i think it's really interesting too to just getting into I don't want to take this too off topic, but how like timeouts in basketball align with this because it's, it's, I think we have a lot more interventions in other sports. It's just the, it's just the task constraints specific to basketball. And I think there can be an advantage to a timeout, but it's again, how we approach it is very different. So a, it's like as coaches, we, we like the staff here at prep, we are all very intentional with our language so for instance, most timeouts would be very scripted where it would be, you must do this, go here, and the coach would draw something on a whiteboard, right? So yeah, we would still use a whiteboard, but the language is completely different. So we'd be like, all right, and we might say, we might even use the language affordance because the guys know what that is. So we might say, look for an opportunity or look for an affordance here. So say we draw something up on the board and we've got, maybe it's like a play with four different triggers in it. But what we're saying is uh, every part of a trigger would say, you know, look for an opportunity here. You might have, based on how they've been defending us all game, you might have a cut or a curl here. If we don't have anything, the next trigger will be this. We might have this. Or what do you guys think might be an option? So I think that's interesting too, because it's, you know, you you can definitely apply this stuff to timeouts too. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You made me think there that timeouts are, opportunities for interaction yeah. which ca- which can be good or bad exactly <laughs> because you know it's it's a it's a temptation isn't it for the for the coach to insert themselves into the uh you know with their kind of external perspective to insert themselves with their ideas as to what ought to take place whereas if you're intentional about it it can be an opportunity to again and you, you, this is where your your um your scaffold, your framework, your language framework is helpful because if you allow the play, not allow, sorry, if the players are to a certain extent leading that because they are playing back their their uh, experience in the environment and then also playing back where they feel the opportunities for exploitation are or whatever it might be, then yeah. 
then they it can take a long time so but if you've got your if you've got your shorthand therefore and you've got your framework it actually really it really can make it very pointed and very neat very much so and it's the key thing too is it's like a lot of the time we'll let them run a lot of the time out sometimes i might not even say anything because i don't need to um and so it's like they will just be talking and i, I get them to sum it up so they might just have like two things they might have the intent to do coming out of a timeout, but it doesn't mean we're going to do it. So even when we do do like an actual play, we will always say we only will use this when we need it, when the when the, we're stopped, because it makes no, I'll give you an example. It's like if you have dominoes by playing fast, it makes no sense to slow down and then run the play that you just drew, which is what almost all teams will do out of a timeout we would say, and we remind them every time out, we would say, we will only use this if we need it. So if we're stopped and, you know, the defense is, we're neutral, we call it neutral, no dominoes is neutral. Okay, let's look to get to this and then, you know, act accordingly. If we can be in green for like three possessions coming out of this timeout, you know, screw the play. Let's let's get the easiest shots we can. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got an intention, a coordinative intention, that we're prepared to throw away if something better arises. Exactly. Um, yeah. What well, a question that occurred to me earlier on is: Do you have defensive dominoes? Great question. So our goal is basically the flip. So our goal on defense is basically to stop the other team being in dominoes, and we we call it neutralize. Just get back to neutral. So it's like we will. So basically, what how we play defense is the opposite to our offense in terms of we are trying to encourage the other team to shoot mid ranges that are contested and take away like the rim and three, right? So kind of the defensive solutions that, that emerge and the things the players are doing, it's all tailored with that in mind. So then for instance, with how we defend the pick and roll, what we'll often do is we might be in a drop coverage where like the defender of the picker is kind of leaving space uh, behind the pick. And then we're basically, what, what that does is it leaves it a lot of space in the mid range, but we're not saying, all right, we're just going to give you an open shot there. The the defender of the ball handler is trying to get back and really contest it or get back in front. So that's kind of our defense. But again, it's very free in terms of the players can change coverages. So we, again, in basketball, what you see is this, this idea of base coverages where the teams will use the same ways to defend actions or plays over and over. What the players have the green light to do is actually change coverages. So, and again, this is where terminology can be useful. They might be like, so we have players from 12 different countries. No, 13, sorry. So what we did is we called the types of defense, like some different things. And so like to trap is WAPA, which is Polish, right? Hedge is heck, which is Danish. So, <laughs> so they might just say, all right, guys, next one, we're going to WAPA. Next pick, we're going to WAPA. And the, it means that the offense, it's unpredictable. And they never truly know what they're going to see when they're coming up against us. And the so, players do. So essentially, like I used a lot. So in, in the world of field hockey, we talk about pressing like they often do yeah. in football now, right? So what we would do is we would usually have a idea of how we might press. So for example, part of the reason, and it's a little, it's a bit formulaic now I think about it. Um, so, so y y what I'm hearing you talk about there is something that I've wanted to do for a long time and I've never got to largely yeah. to do with the environment I'm in at the moment, but it's, it's something I would get to if I did, which is there's, there's a dynamic flexibility be built into your defensive coordination. So, yeah. For example, uh, a press, I often talk about there's various different types of press. There's a lot of talk about pressing, but it's very often quite, it's not, it's not set. I wouldn't say it's set. It's more, it's more conceptual than that. So for example, what we would say is we would generally say, right, we want when the opposition have got the ball and they're bringing it out from the back in their build up phase, obviously we, we want to sort of deny the central area to, to stop long balls. But we also generally speaking, want them to maybe play the ball to one side of the field. So we might offer offer the ball say to the left defender and then and then yeah. work co and then coordinate our activity to kind of lock it there trap it there if you like cool. and minimize the opportunities for action co in a coordinative sense it's not foolproof of course because they sometimes yeah. come out with you know good things um however so that's but the problem is is that often a team will do that the entire game which of course then the opposition begin to attune to naturally and start to exploit where the other options might be or what they can even do within that space 
or sometimes we'll try and identify where there's a vulnerability. So, for example, oh, that player, pretty weak on the ball, panics a lot, gives the ball away. Let's make sure they get it. But it's generally speaking only that. Now, there's lots of others. There's a, there's a what I call a honeypot where we actually we actually um, uh, attract to the middle. So we offer the middle. So what we'll do is our forward players will cut off passing lanes to the wide players and say, here's the ball to the middle. You can either pass to the middle or you can dribble into the middle. We want them actually to dribble into the middle, often because why? Players at the back aren't necessarily usually that good a ball handler. Therefore, come on then, bring it out. And then once you start to come, we're going to converge on you. So I call it a honeypot or a, or a fly trap. You know, we want, we're encouraging it. Look at this, it's nice and juicy in here. Come and bring the ball through. Now we're going to come on. So, but what we don't do very well, so we can sometimes do that or we can do that, you know, but what we don't do is flick between them naturally. Well, and sure. I'd love to get to a place where, so it sounds to me like you're, you've are you got that. You've got that dynamic flexibility in your defense, which can then be a, a, a real puzzle for an offense who are unused to seeing teams do different coordinated things and if they're doing it constantly differently, there's no pattern to it. Therefore, how do we, if pattern recognition is the only thing you do? Now, you obviously have more dynamics in your offense because it's not about pattern recognition. It's about patterns within the patterns. Makes you very, very difficult to defend, even if they do change the pictures. Anyway, I'm going off on one. No, that's 100% it. So it's like, it's repetition without repetition on our def- in our defensive schemes too. So we have these like zones and again, it's like we would not do it for back-to-back possessions. It would just be one and then change, one and change, and the players call it. And it makes the offense even better too because in practice, we don't – like most basketball coaches will have a separate offense against zone, a separate offense against man-to-man. Well, we, for me, that's not that's not adaptability. That's basically very fragile if you have to yeah. you know, do something different every time. So – Again, conceptual offense, it's the same. Whatever defense we see, the players just adapt accordingly. It's the same triggers, but players will obviously be in different spaces against the zone, so that affords different possibilities now, but the players can do it because we practice against it. Love that. Love that. Really interesting. I mean, there's there's, there's so much in there. I mean, it's really rich and... You know, I feel like, you know, it's you, you talked at the start about basketball immersion. It's very immersive as a yes. as a way of looking at the game and the players' interactions within it. Yeah, very much so. And it's it's it can be difficult for like coaches say a lot of the time, like, oh, I need players with a high IQ to play like what you're doing at college prep. But it's like they've got to understand like the players came from all of them came from traditional backgrounds. All of them. And we we only had five players returning. So fifth, we got 20 players, 15 players were new. So it's like, it was an enormous challenge because they all came with like very different bibliographies, like different countries, very, but all like traditional backgrounds. So it was a real challenge. And the guys from last year were like, I really had to involve them in the process because they're like, they found it shocking, but the, 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 but they forgot that they were the same when they arrived. So it's like, if, if you say that players need an IQ to do this, well, they're never going to be able to show what they can do. And it's just, it's for me, it's just really restricting players when you're doing these old school offenses and just not putting them in situations to act more naturally, you know? The, do you know what? It's, coaches say some things and I, it sometimes fascinates me the things that they kind of say. Like that for me, that sort of, you know, I need players with a high IQ to play the way you play or to do the way you play. That's such a sad indictment, isn't it? On on their their a bit i mean like that what that basically says to me is uh i i i'm not capable of yep. creating a learning environment which would enable an individual to develop the kind of game sense and the ga- yep. the game intelligence and i can't create a framework for them to develop that understanding and that connection and and to explore interactions between each other right i can't do that the only thing I can do is draw things on a whiteboard and try and get them to follow the pattern. That's the best I've got. It's just, it's a, really okay. sad. It's a sad indictment on their lim- their limited capability, I would have thought. I don't I know. They probably yes. don't even realize how much that is a sad indictment. It, it's so true. And it's, it's exactly the same. Like I, I've heard of it in other sports too, but it's, it's amazing what the players can do when you just give them opportunities to, to do it. And, uh, I think, yeah, it is. It's kind of the same as the one I get all the time about fundamentals. Um, you know, it's coaches 
you know, saying, oh, they need the fundamentals first. It's the same with our offense. It's like, oh, they need to do a patterned offense before they can play like you. It's like, no, it's it's more damaging to actually do these things first and then try and do a conceptual offense later because players aren't attuned. And I've seen that because I've, as you know, as well as working with the guys here, I've done a lot of camps kind of all over the place. And, you know, I've gone into settings where players are basically robots and it's not their fault, but it's because they've been coached one way to play. And I'm trying to basically go in and break the pattern in like a two day camp. And it can be so difficult because the players are looking at me like, Oh, you're not going to tell me what to do or how to do it? I'm like, no, I'm not. It's fascinating, you know. You just made me think there. Like, it's interesting. A lot of people do think that, don't they? Particularly if you if if you are enculturated to the linear conceptualization of of human learning, that the idea is you need a base of structure, whether it's whether it's a, a fundamental movement pattern structure mm. or a coordinative structure within your team to then build off. So the, the, the thinking is we need a foundation of structure to then allow for, you know, the, this kind of adaptability and flexibility, but actually it works the other way around. What would, so what it is, is when you've developed your framework of interaction and you've developed your um, kind of your, the, the and the, the individuals under, uh, within that have dynamic flexibility in their movement capabilities, their action capabilities struck. It, it actually looks to a certain extent, quite can look quite structured. Structure yeah. emerges. It's a, it's a sort of a an emergent exactly. construct that comes from this, the coordinative patterns that people begin to understand. But it's not because it's imposed. It's because it emerges in response to the environmental constraints. It's, it. it's like a. It looks like exactly like you said. It's like structured to moments of amazing unstructured creativity. Like <laughs> that's that's basically it. Like it. You know, it looks like there's especially watching us play. It, it's not like a free throw. It looks like. It, look, it actually looks way more organized than these patterned offensive teams because of the fact that they're they're so like relentless creating advantages. Um, and that's the irony kind of of it. You you see it, don't you? I mean, I, when I watch when I, you know I watch the NBA quite a bit, and you do see it because you see it's like slow build up. You see them getting organized. You see them doing various things. You see them not working. And then you just basically see a panic, a panic shot because the shot clock's run down. Yeah. So in reality, it does look really unstructured, particularly towards the end when that, you know, all bets are off and it's like, oh shit, better throw it up. But yeah. ne- ne- like, whereas in this scenario, it will look, it will look way more cool. Although it's fast and it's furious and this, that, and the other, that it will look way more, way more organized than that. You will assume that, that oh, these have been well drilled. The, the, these are the I, I, you made me think, I remember a couple of years ago, uh, a few years ago, when I had a little uh, under 11s cricket team and a one coach after that, your team's really well drilled. It's like, it made me smile. Like, not only because he used the D word, but also because, like, uh, I'm like, we're, we're so not. Right, we just coordinate. Why? Because we've understood that if 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 somebody does this and we don't do this, then that creates a massive disadvantage for us. So it's just a natural approach. But it looks like you know they've all been told you must do this and you must do. That. It's quite fascinating. The, the one I get all the time through is like, oh, what drill do you use to get your guys playing like that? And it's you know it's yeah. Anyway, but I think I think too it's it's been really interesting too because you know, applying this stuff across the style of play kind of identity. But then, you know, we've, it's been really cool because we've done it in obviously all the player development, that's a given kind of incorporating an ecological language into like the player dev plans. But then too, what's been great for me is seeing things like athletic development, like our coach at the start of the year, and he's fine with me saying it because I asked him before, he he was doing hypertrophy, which is, you know, traditional. And he's the the best, like one of the most exciting things about using the ecological approach is like the journey of not just the players, but as a staff, as you go through the process. And I really liked, I was reading, uh, listening to the uh, podcast, I think Rob did, Rob Gray did with Matt Woods on like yeah. looking at the CLA, you know, in terms of like the emergence of coaching skill yeah. and just seeing like how our strength coach being kind of involved in this process you know, I was kind of supporting him, but he just, he saw the impact of this with the basketball. And I was obviously sending him some things and nudging him towards it. But it's amazing because now it's transitioned completely. So we're, we're applying like in the weight room, guys have autonomy so they can choose like what they do. They're doing different like tempos, different starts and different grips. And you know, the guys of emergence of, you know, Tyler and Sean have helped us a lot there, but I think when you can apply this to like everything you're doing in a team or an organization, 
it really is. And just seeing kind of how our, what our players are doing now, just really, obviously, I don't have any empirical evidence to this. I would love to hopefully in the future try and do some, maybe some studies and actually record like what we're doing here, but just seeing how our guys move. And see, like, for instance, a very simple tag game, like now just seeing like how they're moving within something like that at the start of the practice, they would never have done that in September. And it's obviously, I can't prove that, but it's just amazing to see each day, like the changes that we're, we're seeing. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, I, my head went straight to Sean and Tyler uh, when you were talking about that. Cause interesting, isn't it? How traditional strength and conditioning as we would have called it has now is now increasingly becoming movement skill. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they, they obviously talk about, you know, they have their um, sport movement skill conference and exactly. there's a new lexicon emerging, particularly amongst ecological dynamicists, which is when we are talking about conditioning, the, the notion of conditioning, physical preparation for performance, it's connected to the functional realities of what an individual will need to do. Now, one of the things I think that's another new frontier, by the way, is because in injury prevention, because mm. I do believe and, and have believed for some time that the constrained static traditional notions of strength and conditioning actually contribute to um to injury now i remember i remember one of the reasons i i have this is where i had this epiphany was i had the privilege one time to spend quite a bit of time observing the the gb field hockey prep they they train not far from me and i'm obviously involved in their their world so i spent time right on the inside uh got to actually go into the briefing room with the coaches and just observe i mean they were really open it was really i was really genuinely quite privileged and then there was also this seminar they did where the coaches were mic'd up and you could hear what they were doing and what we got to see a lot of was how they do their preparation for for training really dynamic mm. and one of the things the coach said was that one of their proud the proudest things they have from a kind of a performance indicator perspective with their dynamic preparation is that they have because they have to go into tournaments where they're playing, you know, something like eight games in 11 days, you know, so recovery and well, that's it. so prep for competition is key. But in their in their preparation for training, which obviously is usually pretty intense, like they're trying to mimic com competition wherever possible, they, uh, you know, they're very dynamic. And as a result of that, they didn't they hadn't had a tournament muscular or tendon or ligament injury beyond um beyond impact you know cool. or or free like accidents yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, beyond that they hadn't had one you know where you just get like a muscular strain in three years wow so it's quite fascinating if you want if you want a healthy team that yeah. you want to try and keep on the roster and keep on the court like this notion has some serious benefits for athlete welfare and think like in the NBA where it's literally millions and millions of dollars mm. and soft, like those soft tissue injuries are so common, like things like patella pains and just all this. And even like ankle sprains, like now with our guys, maybe they get an ankle sprain from collision by landing on someone, but they might be back playing within like two days. Yeah. Because again, of course we don't do things like ice. We do like, we get them moving straight away. And, but, but I think it's just, you look at what would you typically see in like player development at the highest level and especially in basketball think about the impact jumping and doing all these if you're doing the same move every time which is what we see in player development think about the impact that has on the lower body yeah. versus you know Rob, and i think rob's written a, a bit on that in i think it was in how we learned to move but just spreading that impact out through rep without rep and it's it seems obvious and so i'd be very interested to see if like any evidence or like empirically comes out in this sort of the next few years yeah, I mean, like that. This is part of the problem, isn't it? Is because you know this is like field research. You're doing field research. I'm. I feel like I'm doing field research, and I'm trying wherever possible to sort of report back. I need to get a little bit more intentional about that with my reflections, to be honest. Get back into the blogging blogging space, because I'm trying to almost put my field notes into the public domain, and that's not because like I, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not a researcher, and I'm not sure actually there are currently empirical frameworks that we can use that will actually help with this. So, mm. unfortunately, at the moment, we're using essentially you know correlational information, and we but we're not we're not necessarily trying to infer causality. What we're trying to say is, you know, look, we're operating in this way. We're seeing these outcomes, right? Now, the more people who do this, and I, I know people say you know anecdote is not data. However, 
there must be enough, right? So if, if you've got ecological dynamicists, right, you know, you look at your your environment and you've got players emerging who've got a particular type of game intelligence, a particular type of movement capability, a particular type of, uh, op- you know, uh, understanding of, uh, of the dynamics of games and others and interacting with others and opponents and all those sorts of things. If you've got that emerging from your environment, I've got that emerging from my environment, Danny Newcomb's got that emerging from his environment, and we start to sort of begin to look at these environments and see what the common patterns are, that's probably the only way we're going to be able to do this, I'd have thought. Still, again, not causal, but but in in, in it in, at the very least, an interesting an interesting observation to be made about what is emerging from ecologically informed environments. Very true. I think that's that's ultimately true why I'm just like putting quite a bit on social media because it's like I've seen the amazing impact like this stuff has on players and just on life as a whole. And I just want other coaches to see it. And I think more more basketball coaches, especially my, you know, in my context, are just seeing this stuff and intrigued by it. But sometimes they don't, you know, key things like they might miss out on or not have an understanding. And I think that's where it's just a case of like you said, just sharing more and helping practitioners see what this looks like day to day and i think that's how we can really have continue to have a big impact yeah fascinating fascinating could talk to you all day um um but i've got to go and have much less stimulating conversations unfortunately that's not that's (laughs) probably unfair um listen uh thanks for coming on honestly that's a really interesting uh expose really you know thank you for sharing it there's an awful lot of coaches who will try and keep this secret to give themselves that kind of advantage but uh you know you're very open you put it on you put it out there people can interact with it they can learn from it um you know just as a bit of a parting parting salvo what you're doing i think and the fact that you know you're kind of like you know embedded there's a lot of stuff i see in the well there's there are a certain a certain cohort of researchers who are trying to um be really critical of individuals who make this commitment to you know working in this way and exploring in this way you know and they describe it as being dogmatic they describe it as being you know kind of like th- theoretically polarizing and all those sorts of things and they you know they they argue for you know essentially a, a form of relativism you know the it depends crew right who are talking yeah, about you know oh yeah, yeah we we only need to do a bit of this and a bit of that. You know, this is what coaches, you know, it's a hugely misinformed, by the way. And there's loads of element. I could talk about it all day, but this, it depends notion, right? Oh, you know, you, you can't be, they get confused, right? Because they're, they're talking about methodological approach, right? You know, you can use any array of methodology, but you can't, I don't think you can pick and choose your theory of learning, right? No. If you've got a theory of learning that talks about, let's place the human in the center and let's allow them to sort of, you know, kind of interact with the world and draw out from them, right? If you pick and, if you, if you have a theory of learning that based on that, you can't then start telling people what to do. You just my, can't, it doesn't work. It doesn't. My theory on that, Stu, is again, that's a whole podcast. It's, if you're saying that, it's because you can't, like, task simplification, you can't manipulate constraints creatively enough. That's that's kind of like people who say, oh, you still need on-air or traditional practice. For me, it's like a cop-out for not being, like, effective enough manipulating constraints. And that's how I view it when people yeah, say. Or it's because people want, they want to have all, they want to have their cake and eat it. I want to do what I've always done. And I, and I genuinely think it's a, I, I actually think it's a cynical, it's a cynical stance, which is basically to try and say, these eco, these eco people are radicals. You don't have to go in there into their world, like in, their, in the way they're saying, you can stick with what you're doing and just, just, just sample it, you know, dabble with it, which by the way, you can, right? You can, I don't, I've got no problem with anyone wanting to do that. But what you'll probably find quite quickly is that the stuff you used to do is you just quite quickly realize, A, it's ineffective. So why would you do it? And B, um, it actually doesn't philosophically map on. Like, so example, you know, so I say you can't be theory, you can't be, you can't pick and choose theoretically, you can't pick and choose philosoph- philosophically. Otherwise, you've got no roots. Yeah, you just, you're just blowing around in the wind, and in which case, then you've got no basis. Now, the problem you've got is when I ask coaches about what they're, I, I was at, a, at 300 coaches in a room in America, they're soccer coaches, and I asked the question, what's your theory? What's your theory of learning? Or have you got a theory of learning? A couple of hands go up, right? That would be true anywhere I went. I'm not being, I mean, it's not America particularly. It's everywhere, right? Because coaches are not versed in theories of learning. Once you get an understanding of theories of learning, once you start to then get some philosophical roots as to what your practice looks like, you can't waver from that because then who are you? Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, just thought I'd take just throw us in there. Listen, <laughs> um, got five. Uh, just look, I know you're out there, and lots of people are talking to you. Some people might have not come across. I know you're also very willing to talk to anybody about any of this. So, what's the best way for people to get in touch? Absolutely. So, uh, Twitter is probably best. Just uh, Alex Alex J Sarama. Uh, shoot me a Twitter DM, and then. To like any coaches in the ecological community, I'm lucky to live in a beautiful part of Italy. So like, feel free to like drop by and see what we're doing. Um, I'm very eager to like share and connect with other coaches in the space and just keep learning. Amazing, amazing. Keep keep doing what you're doing. It's a highlight of my it's a highlight of my my morning routine. Looking at what you've put out there on one of your enormous Twitter threads. So no, I, keep it yeah. going because it's it, it it honestly it brightens up my day. Um, and thank you for coming on and, and sharing your journey. And I'm sure we'll speak again because it's fascinating. Thank you so much, Stu. I really appreciate it. Uh, where are we? There we go. Uh,